Hello uh, students, this is a course on analytical mechanics or analytical dynamics and this is targeted towards students in their um, bachelor, final bachelor years um, like BSc or and also first year MSc. Okay, this will also be useful for students who are doing their BTEC in different Indian universities. The goal of this course is twofold. One, we want to develop the language that will enable us to, compre to comprehend the world around us in its details. And what we are really interested in is the details at the fundamental level. Okay, And the second, we would like to learn to appreciate and cultivate the thought process that leads to the formulation of questions in their ever increasing cleaner and deeper forms, which will lead us to a deeper and much more beautiful forms of understanding of the world around us. So that's um, the goal at, at a deeper level. And of course, as we go around, we will learn, we'll be learning things um, in this subject. So let me start by uh, recollecting what we already know, what you all have seen in your, in your physics courses. So I start by writing this very familiar equation. Okay, that's the Newton's uh, second law, which says that the acceleration, which is a vector quantity, okay, so let's say we are imagining a particle which has mass m, okay, and it is subjected uh, a force f. Okay. Then it will accelerate according to this relation. Okay, that's your Newton's second law. Uh, let me write it in a slightly different form, which will be useful to ask further questions. So instead of writing A for acceleration, let me introduce the following notation. I write vector r at any time t to be the Cartesian coordinate of the particle with mass m, okay? So r would be the Cartesian Okay, and instead of writing A, I will write R double dot. And these two dots signify that I am taking a second derivative with respect to time. Okay, that's what uh, R double dot means. So with this, I can write R double dot as force over mass, okay? Let me also specify the arguments that enter uh, into the force. The force could, in principle, depend on where the particle is at the time t. So it depends on, it could depend on the r, okay? It could depend on velocities, how fast that particle is moving. It could depend on other things, and it could also depend on time. Okay. Now, when you look at this equation, what uh, comes to your mind? And there are several things which um, we can think of. One is at a very philosophical level. You see, what this equation is saying is that if you tell what are the forces this particle is experiencing, okay, if you tell that, I can tell what the acceleration is. Now, if you know the acceleration at any point of time, then you can integrate that equation and get the trajectory. You can tell where the particle would be at any later time t if you solve this equation. And also, on the top of it, you have to specify initial conditions, where it was at time t equal to zero, how fast it was moving at time t equal to zero. Okay? That information will be sufficient to tell all this. So coming to the philosophical thing, 
it's non-trivial that there are such laws. Okay, it's a non-trivial statement that we can predict what will happen later. Okay, that's the uh, philosophical thing. But let's say we agree upon that universe is describable, describable by laws. Okay, that what can more be asked from this equation? Okay, you can ask why it is second second order. Okay, why only derivatives uh, which are second order d two t over d t square involved in this relation? Now that has to come from your um, experimentation experiences. You see, when you say it is second order in a time derivative, it means that the solution will involve two constants of integration. You see, when you integrate it first, you will get down from r double dot to r dot, okay? And you will have a constant of integration, let's call it C1, which cannot be determined by uh, this equation. That's a physics input. Then you integrate once more, you arrive at r, that is what you're looking for. But then at this stage, you get one more constant integration, C2, okay? So two constants of integration you will uh, have which you typically know that they are the coordinates at any time t, uh, at any initial time, let's say t equal to zero, and the velocity of the particle at the same time. You could use them um, to fix what C1 and C2 are. Okay, but I mean, why should this be a second order uh, differential equation? Okay, could Newton have chosen this to be a third order differential equation? Could he have written something involving three, three uh, derivatives? Okay, that's one thing you can ask. And it's not a very difficult uh, thing to answer. Okay, imagine we could, then it would imply that I have a relation like this. Okay, I'm keeping up to the second, uh, second time derivative in here. So all uh, derivatives lower than r triple dot, I, I keep on the right hand side in the definition of force. Okay. Okay, let's see what happens if you try to write down such an equation. Okay, let's say we take a particle which is free, there is no no force acting on it, so I can put down the F to be zero. Okay, let's say I take a particle which is free. Okay, by free I mean no forces which acting on this one. Then you have R triple dot zero. Okay, now if you write down the solution of this equation, oh, okay. Uh, this will involve uh, three constants of integration, vector A, vector B, and vector C. Okay, remember this, uh, this is this equation, for example, here, it's not one equation, it's three equations. There is one equation for each Cartesian component. So one equation for Rx, Okay, one equation for R, instead of Rx, I can say, um, I can say X, X, Y, and Z. Okay, so these are uh, the three, so you, you should read it, read it as X triple dot as one over F, Fx, Y triple dot as one over M, Fy. Okay, so these are really three equations. So each vector equation becomes three uh, equations. Okay, so coming back to this, if you solve it, you'll get uh, such a result after integrating. And clearly, if you choose time, uh, the particle to be at rest at time t equal to zero, so you put r of zero, that would be your c. Okay, so this you can fix by telling where the particle is located at time t zero. Very good. 
Similarly, the B you will be able to fix by telling how fast it was moving or what the velocity was at time t equal to zero. Okay, you take one derivative, this C will be gone, this will leave only B behind and this will involve t, put t equal to zero, this term is also gone, so you have only B left. So you will be able to fix B by initial velocity. Okay, and as you can see here, um, that this A, you will um, need to specify, for example, what the acceleration was at time t equal to zero before you could really tell what r at any time t would be. Okay, so this constant will not be get uh, will not be determined by telling just the coordinate and the velocity at time t equal to zero. You will also need to specify the acceleration at time t equal to zero. But you already know from your experience that that's not how our nature works. You just need to tell these two things, where and the velocity. You don't need to specify acceleration to know where it would be at any later time t, which means that your equations should be second order differential equations. And these are ordinary differential equations. And they cannot involve terms uh, which are uh, der derivatives in time uh, more than two, okay? Cannot have second order, uh, third order, or fourth order. That's one thing um, about the equation, which was our force law. Um, now let's move to something even, even deeper. Let's say we have established that indeed, if I solve this, um, this, this Newton's equation, I will be able to tell uh, the future trajectory, okay? Imagine you have n number of particles, lots of particles in your system, and each of them is, um, Let me put an index i to emphasize particle number i. Not necessarily i here, it could be, it could, the force could depend on the coordinates of all the particles, okay? So let's say i runs from one to n. You have n number of particles in your system and j also runs from one to n. Sorry, this, this, should, this is one, okay? So what this uh, equation is saying is that the acceleration of ith particle at time t would be determined by what this, what force it is experiencing. And that force depends on the coordinates of other particles and their velocities and time t. That's the most generic thing which you can write. Now let's ask, can we say something more without going into the details of the system based on our, some general understanding of how, uh, how, how the world is, okay? One thing you clearly know from, uh, your, uh, from your education for uh, previous years, that if I do an experiment now, okay, whatever results I get, I will get the same results if I were to do that experiment, let's say 100 years from now or 1000 years from now, okay? Meaning it does not matter when you do that experiment. This is, um, uh, this can be put more um, formally as saying that the time is homogeneous, okay? So what I'm saying is there exist frames of references in which time is homogeneous, which means you, whether you do experiment now or one billion years from now, the results will be identical if you have arranged everything identically in these two uh, different times, okay? That's one thing, so. There are frames, special frames called inertial frames 
in which time flows in a homogeneous matter, manner. Time is homogeneous, okay? That's nice. There's also another fact which you um, um, definitely know, is that if you take your experimental setup, okay, whatever experiment is happening, you, you take this thing, and instead of doing it here, let's say you do it a million kilometers away from here, okay, or billion kilometers away, whatever results you will get here, it's the same you will get um, by doing the same experiment uh, millions or billions of kilometers away. Okay, so this location is in no, mat in no manner special uh, uh, compared to any other locations. All locations are equivalent. Meaning if I take my uh, setup and translate it to another location, this way, that way, okay, this way, Whichever way you take it, if you do a translation by some amount A, A is a vector, okay? If you, if you uh, translate everything by amount A, your results will not depend on the choice of A, okay? You do the experiment wherever you wish to. And this is more uh, formally said, that, uh, said as the following. So you say that space, is homogeneous, okay? All, all locations are equivalent. That's what uh, this sophisticated sounding sentence means, okay? And that's the property of a special kind of a frame which we call inertial frames. There's still more one uh, thing which you know is that if you take your experimental setup, okay? And now I'm not putting it somewhere, uh, I'm not taking it in a different place. All I'm, I want to do is take this experimental setup and reorient it. So instead of, let's say, it was something was going from here to there, something was being measured here, there were forces, that you take the entire setup and rotate in this way, okay? Or this way, or whichever way you like. Doing this rotation will also not change the outcomes of your experiment. Okay, all orientations are equivalent. And this we say more formally as that space is isotropic. Okay, isotropic meaning equivalent in all directions. So I say space is isotropic. S P A C E space is isotropic. Okay, very nice. So you see, um, what we have um, written down is really nice. We are not telling about what will happen to a particle when it is uh, in, in such a frame. We are telling things about how time behaves in such frames. See, generally when you, when you talk about inertial frames, you'll be told that if there is a particle and it is not acted upon by any forces, if it is at rest or if it is in uniform motion, it will remain so, okay? That's how you say. But now we are describing inertial frames not by appealing to what happens to a particle, but rather saying what is the nature of time in such a frame and space, nature of space in such a frame, okay? And this will be very useful for us in, um, in understanding our uh, laws of nature. Okay, so we have, let's put it in a box and we'll try to make slightly more mathematical statements of based on it. Okay. Okay, now you say that's all nice. You have something about um, um, some understanding of inertial frames. Now, what can we, um, um, uh, what more can we say now? Well, one thing it's clear 
that the system of your particles, which is, let's say we are looking at an inertial frame, okay? Then that system of particles should somehow know that they are in an inertial frame. They have to know that time is homogeneous in this frame, that space is homogeneous, that it is isotropic. What part of the system knows about these things? And clearly, let's, let's write down our um, equation of motion. So we had, let's go back here, I think, I, here, this thing, okay? Now if I'm saying that each particle is going to accelerate according to the forces, then it has to be those forces which will know about the frame, right? There's nothing else on the left-hand side. Left-hand side is just the acceleration of that particle. And how much to accelerate and in what manner is told to it by the forces, which is on the right-hand side. Okay, so the right hand side has to know about, about this information which we uh, wrote here, okay? So let's uh, have a look at this. Mm, should I write? Okay, let's, let's write it again. So I want to now talk about first homogeneity of time. is a okay so m i r i double dot is force on ith particle which depends on where each particle is located at that time okay i'm suppressing the t here i could have put a t here as well which i'm suppressing for now j and t Okay, that's what we wrote earlier. Now let's see what uh, homogeneity of time has to say about the forces. Now imagine you're doing the experiment now, okay? And all the forces are behaving whichever way they behave and you get the accelerations of each of the particles at this time, okay? Now as I said, you can do the experiment thousand years later and you should expect everything the same, meaning all the particles will move around in time in exactly the same manner. But that can happen only if the forces do not change over time, right? If after, do, if I do start doing experiment one million years later, and because of this time dependence, forces change and everything will change, okay? The evolution of the system will not be the same if the forces depended on time, so clearly, this T cannot appear in the force, okay? Now remember, I'm talking about a system which is insulated from or isolated from all other things. The system is self-contained. There, no, there are no external forces on the system. Whatever forces individual particles are experiencing, they are due to all other particles in the system, okay? That's very important. Otherwise, what I'm saying is not true. So that's nice. We have said that the forces in an isolated system cannot be function of time. Uh, that's already a progress. Let's see what homogeneity of space implies. Okay, again, let me write it down. Force on the ith particle. Okay, now you see, here we are saying that we need to know where exactly each particle is located. So let's say, let's say the system of two or 20 particles, it doesn't matter, L look at two of them, okay? L let's look at the force on a particle here. I'm saying the force on this is determined by the particle here, there, 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 okay? It really depends on R, J, where J runs from uh, uh, 2 to N. Let's say this is particle number one. Now, because of homogeneity of space, if I take the entire setup and move to some other location, if I do a translation by a vector A, so I, let's say, just translate everything along X axis, nothing should change, right? Whether I experiment I do here or take the entire box, put somewhere else, nothing should change. 
which would mean that the forces should not care about where this guy is, where that guy is, where that guy is, uh, I mean, what are the exact locations of those other particles at time t. But what it should care about is, what is the separation between this and that? We are talking about the forces on this. So separation between this and that, separation between this and that, okay? This and that, this and that. Because everything should give the same answer if I translate from here to there. Meaning, the forces cannot depend on the locations of uh, all the particles, but rather only on their differences, okay? So I will uh, write Rj minus Rk, okay, and K and J and K run over all the particles, okay. T anyway was already gone. So you see we have been able to put much more restriction on the nature of uh, on, on the arguments that can enter into the force. Instead of having this full freedom here, now we have much more restricted form. T is gone and the coordinates cannot appear directly, they can only appear in differences, okay? That's good. How about uh, the homogeneity? Okay, homogeneity we have taken care of. Let's talk about the isotropy. Or even before I do isotropy, let me um, okay, isotropy. Uh, let, let's talk about. We'll come to isotropy later. Let's talk about something else. There's something more we um, know about nature. Is that if you are doing an experiment in one inertial frame, whatever that frame is. Okay, I will not go into details of how you find a uh, inertial frame that I believe you already know. Um, if you are given an inertial frame, okay, and you take another frame, which is moving in with a uh, constant velocity with respect to this frame, okay, then both the frames are inertial. Whatever physics you see in the first frame is exactly what you are going to see in the second frame, okay? Physics will not change by moving from this inertial frame to another frame which is in a, in a, which is in a uniform motion with respect to the first one, okay? Um, now I want to put this information into our equations of motion, meaning it will be clearly the force which will know about this. So um, this, let's call it um, relative motion. Of frames, okay, uh, F R A M E S. Okay, so what will happen is this will be now already you had R J minus R K from the homogeneity of space. Time was an already gone. Now if you go to another frame in which, uh, which is moving with some velocity v with respect to the first one, all the particles, whatever their velocities were at time t in the frame number one, will change to the velocities what they had plus the velocity of this frame, right? So all of them will get, uh, all the velocities at time t will get added by this fixed amount, okay, which is the relative velocity between the two frames. So clearly, because the physics is not going to change, the force should not care about what the velocities are in a given frame. Okay, what are, the, what are the velocities of each of the particles in that given frame? What it should care about is only the relative velocities. Because when you go from one frame to another frame which are moving with respect to each other, the relative velocities are not going to change. Okay, because when you take the difference, the additive part drops out. Okay, so which means that I should not have rj dot, but I should have r, sorry, r j dot minus rk 
dot. Time was anyway gone. So these are the constraints which we have been able to put on the forces. And let me give you one example which is very familiar to you so that you can see that indeed the forces which you already know are of this form. So let's go back to our Mr. Newton, okay? Newton's force of gravitation. What is it? So let's say you have two particles, particle number one, particle number two, okay? Some origin O and I say this is the coordinate R1. That guy is at R2. These are the vectors. Now I want to know the force on the first one. Clearly the force on the first one will be directed towards two because it is being pulled into two. It's the gravitational force. So the force on particle number one would be G M M over R square. It's a inverse square law, you know. And then you have a unit vector where this is the unit vector, okay? I can write down R hat more clearly for you. It will be R2 minus R1, okay? You see, this is R2, R1, if you subtract, this is what you'll get over um, R2 minus R1 modulus. That's the magnitude of it. So that's why this is a unit vector. And this R is, uh, this R is just R2 minus R1 modulus square. Okay, you see the force depends only on the uh, differences in the, uh, the, the positions of these two particles. It doesn't care where this guy is and where that guy is individually, but only on the differences. Here you also don't see any time. And in this force, there is no velocity involved. Okay, that's um, all for uh, this video. And we'll start talking about, I believe, um, yeah more about the coordinates which we should use in studying um, different kinds of systems, what kind of coordinates are uh, suitable. Uh, we'll have a long discussion uh, on that next time. Okay, see you.